so so. As you can read, I will try to explain a little bit of framework less approach in, the, in PHP using some DDD behind the scene. A lot of hype for the title, I will just put using memes for the rest of the presentation, just saying. So, so just cool. A few words about me. Uh, I'm Damiano. I'm a software engineer, and I started a little bit more than five years ago. I'm, let's say, good in PHP and Golang. That's my focus, at least. And I'm also in love with methodologies and domain-driven design, as you can guess, it's just my favorite one. I come from Italy. I don't look Italian because I'm super white, but yeah, that's from where I come from, exactly from Tivoli. It's an amazing town where there are a lot of fountains that have been built during the, the Roman Empire, full of gardens, it's really, really beautiful. And it's also known for the huge holes on the ground. There are some people that just went there and still trying to figure out how to go out from the holes. Friends of mine said that they have been fixed it, but I don't believe I have just to go back and check that actually all the holes have been fixed. It's also famous for the modern art and the arch that we do have. Really, really beautiful. And also for the traffic. So you don't see it, but at the very end, there's a bus that is stuck in the traffic because someone just decided to leave the car in the middle of the street to go to a shop and buy some things. That's the Italian way of parking, I, th I guess. Apart from jokes, yeah, Tivoli is amazing. You should go there and visit it. I'm not paid by the city, but anyway, I don't, find that's, I don't know why I'm talking about it, but by the way, that's me every day at work when I try to, to look serious and give answers, but end up usually like this. So, before we start talking about everything, I should just make clear some things, but I'm quite sure that all of you already know. So, what is a framework? So, it's an essential supporting structure of building vehicle and objects, right? So, it's just a tool that will help us, and actually this explanation from Oxford dictionaries makes sense because we as software engineers were always trying to build cars and shapes, right? Exactly in object-oriented programming, that's the one-on-one way to approach it. Those are the, I think, the most used framework in PHP. How many of you know and use Symfony? I think almost all of you, right? Yeah. Laravel? Yeah, I mean, we're almost a 50-50. And funny thing, I will be using frameworks to explain framework less. I, don't, I know it doesn't make sense right now, but later on I, just, I promise you that I will try to make my best to make it, uh, to make it happen. And there are also other frameworks such as Slim, uh, Zen that has been moved to Expressive right now, and also CakePHP, EECON Igniter. I don't know if, is anyone still using them? Legacy, right? Cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. Frameworks are really, really important. And we know that they have a lot of benefits. They push for innovation, because every time a new framework uh, came out, or there is a new release of the same framework, or just new ideas just bump out, frameworks just bring with us a new approaches that we can use in our daily work. It's not only, of course, for the frameworks, but also because sometimes behind the scenes there's uh, the language updated, so it's a requirement, for, for example, to, put, to go from PHP 5.6, that I hope no one is using anymore, to 7. And it's also useful because it will help us to do not reinvent a wheel. So we know that we want to save as much time as we can and delegate functionality that exists and are stable and already been coded by the community. Is frameworks are really important because they define standards. And in PHP, we have an amazing example, right? We have the PHP fig and the PSRs. How many of you, of you just know what is a PSR? Good. So for the people that didn't uh, raise their hand, so PSR are just libraries 
that expose only interfaces that are built by the PHP community. So almost all the maintainers of frameworks or big libraries in PHP just gather into, uh, it's just, I think, a Google group and explain and try to figure out how to build things. And all those standards are used across frameworks. So if we're using an HTTP request on Symfony, we can use it in, C in Slim as well. So we're using the same interface, so we don't have to load our, our mind and try to go to documentation and find out what is the uh, request. And of course, frameworks are important for new joiners, uh, so that they will not have to understand how everything has been built, because it's already documented, and I'm pretty sure that also the, the junior figures now are studied frameworks just to get an idea about how thing works. So you have just zero cost of onboarding people about the tech, more or less. It's not always like this, but yeah. So it has a lot of advantages. But using a framework has a cost. And the cost is really, really high. That guy, who, who are you, who raised the hand because they're using still super old software? You, right? That's it. So this is, I, I struggled to find this thing. It's a GitHub repository. You can find it here. It's using Y1. So I, I don't know how, actually how many years ago has been released. I have no idea. But this is the cause of our legacy monolith. And here, if you are working here in Berlin and you are in a startup that is just uh, born uh, thanks to Rocket Internet, probably you're, you're using Bob and Alice, two bad names that you maybe you don't want to remember, but are two huge uh, PHP applications, one written in Zend1, another one written in U1, and it's just a bootstrap for the, st for the startups. And the point is that 10 years ago, or however, whenever, just what has been released, the e framework one, that was the thing. It was, God, yes, now we have something, right? It was, I think, one of the first frameworks that had been released because when it came out, everything was already built in. We already know how to deal with the persistent layer, so dealing with databases, with connections, with requests, how to have authorization, just everything that was already built. So it was really, really cool. But after some time, let's say 2,000 commits, that's how it just ends up, yeah. Today, that's more or, less, more or less like this. I think all the company now have legacy code, and mostly because probably it's just f due to old frameworks that they are still using, because they're not going to move easily from it. If you don't have legacy, just reach me out after, and I will just join your company, probably. So the idea I have in mind is that all are matter about dependency. So a dependency is just a state of relying on being controlled by someone else or something else, right? And that's actually what happened with the frameworks, right? Because also if you would like to move easily, to use a new library, to use something new, we cannot, because there's something that is stuck to us. It's just pushing us down. And the framework is a dependency, at least in my mind. Feel free to disagree with it and reach me out if you want to discuss about it. And because frameworks impose you a way to write software, if you just use it and embrace it, right? You go just on the documentation, copy and paste code, it works. So frameworks tell me how I should be writing code. A couple of years ago, these things came out. Is a framework class movement, amazing name. It's just a markdown file on a GitHub repository. And it's just a set of, let's say, philosophy that tell you to use, instead of using the whole framework, maybe just use small libraries and compound them all together. Because it actually may make more sense. Because they will be helping you in the future, so you can easily decouple the one single library, if you're using it properly, and replacing with another one instead of changing the whole framework, because you cannot introduce, introduce just one big, huge breaking change. Of course, you can avoid dependencies uh, in really a lot of ways. For example, you can just write everything from your own. 
I don't know if it makes sense. You can try to protect you and your team using interfaces that just you wrap functionality behind a scene. Yeah, you can do it, of course. But today, what I want to talk about is just trying to use domain-driven design. How many of you know about domain-driven design a little bit? It's just one of the topic that is on fire. Just, okay. So, and why? This is the idea. We may use really a, a lot of way to avoid dependencies, but why I, I want to focus on the DDD methodology? Because the domain is not a dependency. Every time a PO or PM just come to our table or during meetings, just explain. They don't say, damn, please, we really need to remove this library because it doesn't make sense for us. So just don't use any more framework, uh, uh, Symfony, but use Laravel. How many of you ever heard something from that by, from a PO? I don't think it never happened. What PO said is just, hey, we have a feature and we want to change it. We want to delete it or we want to add a new feature. So the point is that you have to keep in mind that what you're dealing with every day is a domain. It's everything that is realizing a product. It's part of the product itself. So, DDD, amazing term. So what it is, DDD? So DDD is a methodology that has been, that came out uh, from Eric Evans, uh, has been written for the first time on a book called Domain Driven Design, yeah. And what does it explain? Just that your focus when you're building software should not be on the technology only, but should be on the product, on the domain. So what you're realizing. So I know that we as tech people love to write amazing software, but we need to keep in mind that it's really important, not only for us, but for business too, that is the people that is paying us, that then they want a, a really good product so that the user can enjoy it. I know that is not really the best explanation I can give to DDD, but it will end up just having a talk about domain driven design. And the point of applying domain driven design is that instead of just going right into the solution, you try to understand the problem. So when I was working back in Italy in a company, the CDO was just talking about a new product, and they would say, OK, for this product, we are going to use Symfony. And we had no idea what the product was about. We already had the solution ready. We were using Symfony. But I had no idea what was the problem to solve. So the good thing about DDD is just focus you to think about what is the product. So what is the, the thing that you want to solve? What's the problem that you want to solve? And then you will solve it by its own, and you can easily attach everything around it. DDD can be split in two big areas, strategic design and tactical design. And I will be going into some topic both of strategic and tactical. Now we'll be just listing a lot of terms that you may know or not, and just get confused. First one is ambiguous language, then bounded context, then you will see partnership, shared kernel, customer supply development, there's a lot of even more. And on tactical des uh, design, there is the value object, there are, there are entities, there are aggregates, there are domain events, and there are domain services. Now that all of you are confused, I can start explaining them a little bit. So strategic design. So what is strategic design? So the, the part that is called strategic in domain driven design is the part that is actually setting the rules that makes your product unique. So you understand what are your invariants, what are your rules, what are your constants. And it will help you also to define the boundaries, so the area of your software, of your whole domain, find a w finding a good way to make them communicate all together, and building a language to use when you are referring to terms. The ubiquitous language that, in my opinion, my honest opinion is just feel free to disagree, is the most important thing in domain driven design. And is just a set of terms that you use to build a language that you use within domain experts, so people who actually know about the domain and the consumers of the domain. So it may be just a customer, 
that just relate to the customer care to explain that something got wrong, or can be just our product owner that reach us and try to explain what's broken or what we want to add or change. And why I'm saying it? Because communication is really important. So, fun fact, that thing happened for real in my company. It was a joke, it was my high key run, if you're looking at me somewhere. It was my tech lead that was just trying to talk to me, this is, should be Italian, and he was just trying to communicate with me just using BDB, BDB, hand, hand gestures. And that's why communication is important, because you're not just go there and try to speak with someone, just pretending to be, in my, in my, in my case, Italian. And, and why communication is important is because we, if you, we find a good communication, we will have less noise when we communicate, right? So if I'm going to a junior developer, to a product owner, or someone that is a stakeholder, when I'm defining, for example, the word customer, they exactly know what I'm referring to, right? And the communication is also really important because our product change and we need to take track of all the changes on how the domain and the product evolves. And using a good language will just help us. For example, if we're moving concept, for example, from customer to user, for, us, for any specific reason, we know and we map in our mind that there's a reason. And third thing that is actually, in my opinion, the really cool thing is that, as I said before, Junior developers use frameworks and they're documented, so they already know what they're, they're going to do with the code, right? But when someone is onboarded, they can also be the best engineer ever, but they don't know about the domain. They don't know about the product, so they need to be onboarded, right? And if you're using a good communication and a good language to explain terms and concepts, all the people will just get rid faster, so they will be ready to be 100% uh, with 100% of their capability to write code. Uh, actually, a good example that I, I can think about is that frameworks, the most of the frameworks that I can think about, came out with a user bundle or a user concept, right? But in the most of the domain, maybe it's not a user, it's a customer, right? So you may still use the user word in the framework, but you see that there's a mapping that you have to do in your mind, this cognitive load, right? So when you talk to your PO, you're referring to a customer. When you're looking at code, user. The second thing about strategic design is the uh, bounded context. So this is a context map. is a way to visualize your whole domain and how different parts of your domain should be communicating one with each other. So we can have three kinds of domain. The core domain that, as you can guess, is the most important one by the name, is just where your business should be really good. So, and waste a lot of time and energy in writing good software that is stable, because it's the thing that is going to make you money. On the other hand, we have supporting subdomain. So, as you can see now, the term change is not anymore a domain, but it's a subdomain, so it's a, it's a specific smaller area. And it is specialized on our product, so we'll know about some rules. For example, we'll know that our customer email should end with at gmail.com, but they're not really the thing that is going to make us money. On the third level, we have generic domain, and those are domains that are easily outsourced, or when we build it, we are just going to build it as totally generic domains. For an example, can be an email dispatcher. So MailChimp can be a generic domain, right? So we know, we know that we want to send an email. We don't care about any kind of rule. We just know that we want to send an email. If an email is valid, this is the content, just send an email. That's the only thing that we do care. And why context matter? Now, the thing goes weird. So, being naked. So, it's an hardcore example, but just, it works. So, think that now I'm totally naked, right? So, what if I'm naked under a shower? It's totally fine, right? I'm alone, I'm washing myself, I'm happy, I'm probably singing like this guy. But if I'm naked in the office, there's, there's something that may not go that well, right? So, a context 
give us the behavior. So we know that in a given context, we should be behaving in a specific way. Of course, you can try to be naked in the office. I don't know about where are you working, but up to you. And also, if the context looks super, super similar, you have to keep in mind that every context has their own rule. If we're nude in a nude beach, everything is fine, right? We have sand, there's the sun, there's, right? All the people around us are naked, it's amazing. But in the same area, so everything looks pretty similar, but it's not in a not nude beach, it will probably end up like, like this. I've never been naked in a, in a beach, but that's what my, I have in mind. Probably will end up like this. And the context is really important also in code, right? As you can guess. So context is explaining us and imposing our rules. And my favorite example, because it's pretty easy, is an email. If you think about Gmail UI, when you try to log in or register for the first time, your email must end with at gmail.com. Otherwise, that email is not valid in their domain. But if you think about it, probably in your product, in your service, all the emails are valid, right? The important thing is that it is a good format because customer will have different kind of, uh, of domains on email. There are really a lot of ways to try to make communicate different bound and con different contexts together. There are a lot. I already had a talk about it in my company. And they are really, really a lot, and will take more than one hour to explain them all. So we'll just, I will just list them, confuse you, and go ahead. If you, have, if you want to have any feedback about it or any information, just reach me out after the talk. On the other hand, after strategic, we have tactical design. And there, that's the thing that most of you will like. So that's the part that is a little bit more code related. So when the strategic design just explained all the rules, now we have to apply them as code. The most important thing in the tactical patterns are entities. How many of you know the entity terms? I think all of us, right? It's just super known. And I will just have an example later why I ask that question. Uh, so an entity is just a mutable object that owns an ID. So if you have two customers, and those two customers have the same ID, they are the same thing. They are representing the same thing. We have also in DDD the concept of aggregate. So what is an aggregate? This amazing term. The aggregate is just a cluster that has a lot of entities inside. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just a cluster of full of of, of entities. And there's also the aggregate root, and, where, and the only difference between an aggregate and an aggregate root is that you have a, an ID. And when you're just retrieving this ID, you're retrieving the root from the aggregate. So it's just an entry point to retrieve the aggregate from the persistent layer. The idea behind having entities, or just in general aggregates, and this is the term that I will try to use from now on, an aggregate must be always in a valid state, so that when we build it in the code for the first time, we know that we can save it, we can store it. Now, that's the Laravel way of handling the, the, the entity, the aggregate. And as I said before, this is not an entity in Laravel. This is a model. So it's, a, it's the, representing the same thing, but it's a different term. And how many of you just write Laravel every day and deal with models every day? OK. So it is an anemic model. So what does it mean? It's just not expressing any kind of behavior. It's just a set of rules. It's a set of data that you can easily create. And is using behind the scenes Eloquent. It is an active record implementation uh, of an ORM. So what does it mean? You means, it means that you can actually query this object. You can say, OK, user, create it with this data and save it just in one line of code. The bad thing about this model is that you can create it as an empty model. So I can just say new user and then user save. And I will have a new record in persistence. And that's 
hopefully is not good. On the other hand, Symfony. Uh, now Symfony uses the entity word in their doc documentation. So what's the main difference between this and the model in Laravel? This one is just a pure PHP object. Doesn't have anything else, it's just PHP. Doesn't have any ORM behind the scene, right? So it's just representing something. You may use annotation that will help you to map this model when you're trying to save it on the database. But you can also move this, conf this, configura this annotation in a configuration file. So you're, you will end up with an entity that's just a plain PHP object. And that's really good. The bad thing here, too, is that in documentation, there's no bold text that say, hey, you should just be uh, creating your object always in a valid state. So here, too, you can create a product that is totally empty, empty and store it. But how a model should be looking like? So this is a model, a simple model, it's an article, has some properties, has a private constructor, and the reason why there's a private constructor is because here, can you read it from the... You don't hear me at all, right? Okay, yeah, there's a guess, okay, cool. Uh, you can use a create, because in a specific domain, you want to say, I'm going to create an article, right? If the, the domain expert were going to say, I'm going to you know, write an article, maybe I, were, I, I, I was going to use the, the write word instead of create. And do you remember about context that I said before? Here we are dealing with two different contexts. We have the article, that is just an article, but we also have author. And why I'm splitting author ID and author details here? Why I cannot just use the author entity and put it inside? The main reason is that because if I'm going to use it as just an object itself, it means that when I'm going to store it in the database, the real author is going to be updated. Because when I'm building an aggregate, it will be a single unit. So when I will be storing that, that aggregate, everything will be updated or created in persistence. I'm splitting them so I can just use references. So author ID is just an ID, and if for any reason in this domain of the article I want to use the name and the surname of the author, hiding all the other information such as email, password, when he's burned or whatever, I can use it. So I have just a small amount of data and I'm not carrying the whole data that I need. As you can see, I'm not using any scalar type here. I'm using everywhere objects. And the reason is that because those are value objects. How many of you know the term value object? Hmm. I don't know why I'm having this all, because most of you know about it. So uh, a value object is an immutable object that is representing a value and it's comparable. That's the most important thing. So in order to have a real value object, you have to make it immutable, and you have to make it comparable with another value object. And the reason why you want to make it comparable is because it can be hard comparing objects, right? If you think, for example, full name that has two properties inside, when this object is equal to another full name, when name and surname are actually equal. So you want to expose a behavior that is equal to. And why is it immutable? Because if you think about a value that can be just, for example, an integer is one, when you change it, it becomes two, for example. But one is still one. It's still representing a value. So you're not going to change this one. You're just going to create a new one. This is just uh, an example of, of a value object. This is a, the title of the article. And I'm imposing validation here. So when I'm going to build this value object, it can be valid. It will be only valid if it's going to be built. If not, for example, if the title is too short, as I'm, you now you see that I'm using a domain language. If the title is too short or is too long, then I'm not going to create this object. I will have an exception. The main advantage, is, uh, advantage of having this in place is that, of course, you have one object that is always valid, and you can use anytime you want after it has been created. And the second thing 
is that you're isolating all your validation rule in one place. So it doesn't matter if it comes from HTTP or from CLI, that's the validation rule that we will be using. And later on, I will do an example soon. Another pattern that I want to describe is repository. I think it's the most known domain driven design pattern. I think the most of you knows about it. And it's just an abstraction layer from the representation of the aggregates and their storage. So I'm going to save my aggregates somewhere, and I will be using the repository to, to do it. Now, let's think about how Laravel deals with uh, persistence. So the Laravel way of doing it is, this is just taken copy and paste from the documentation, is so when we want to show a user, we use the user model, and we have a method that is find or fail. So we're dealing with persistence here. It will fail will be a 404. If we'll find it, will be returned it, uh, to the view. And here we can see that the model is really coupled to the framework. So the idea is that if Larva is going to do a breaking change, for example, as it did from the 4 version to the, fi to, the, to the 5, that model will be a pain in the ass to, to update. It will be really, really hard, because I will have to touch everywhere in my code all the time that I'm using a specific function. On the other hand, that's the symphony way of dealing with persistence. It's just you have most, usually you have just doctrine, and you use doctrine to, uh, to deal with the, the database. So you just you create your product, you set some, some values inside, then you persist it. So it means you're actually pushing it in memory. And when you flush it, you're actually doing the queries. So that's way better. Because as you can see, we're splitting the concept about representing something in our domain, so representing a product in our domain, and the how to save it on the database. So it's just a step ahead compared to, to the eloquent, just in my opinion. But the bad thing is that this one will be somehow imposing us the way how to deal with the, with the flow of our, of, of our uh, use case. Because, for example, Doctrine behind the scene does not ex execute the query in the order that you expect. In order to be faster, it just execute update, delete, delete, and then inserts. But if you're in your code, you're just insert and then delete. Now, you have to change your mind of, of thinking how to solve a problem, how to handle your use case. But instead, if we're using a repository, that is what we'll be looking like. So the good thing about domain-driven design and the application of the implementation of these concepts is that you can still use the framework behind the scene. I am still using the framework here behind the scene. So this is just a repository. And I'm using it here to get an article given an ID. So I'm just having a command uh, that has an ID inside, and I will use it to get the article. If something was wrong, I'm using here the domain language, that is, an article does not exist. It's a message that we may want to display to the, to the customer, or there's, sorry, impossible to retrieve the article. It means that something got wrong. But how does it look? Behind the scene, that's a possible implementation. So I'm using Laravel here. And there's this database manager that comes from Laravel. So the idea is that. I will be using the framework, but it will be isolated in a specific place, in a specific layer. And if I will, wa uh, will want to update it or change it in the future, I will have just to change one place. So I can easily make migrate one repository at a time, one model at a time. And here, of course, just a note that you will have to wrap all the exception that the library that you're using may just throw to you, so that you're protecting yourself also in the domain usage. So instead of having, for example, a query exception that Laravel gave us, you will just map it as an impossible retrieve article. Right? So it will be totally decoupled from the, from the framework. Now that we discussed a little bit of, for example, how to handle a possible use case, I have to make you notice that the only part that we are dealing for the moment is the real, is the center. Everything else is still a little bit abstract, right? 
because here I showed to you the oops I can do it the use case so we don't know about what's before this so it may be an HTTP request or whatever we don't know so now we're going to use the framework for real and we're going to use it as it is a library so that's an HTTP request that's always Laravel as you can read from the namespace and this is just a get article controller. So it's just because I like it to have just one action in the controller just as a single object, but you can also have one controller with five methods, methods inside, it's totally fine. And what I'm doing here is that of course injecting the, the dependencies that I need is that what I'm doing is creating and dealing all, only with the domain and translating from a domain language to an HTTP language. So I will get the parameter from the ID. I will try to create the command. If the article, uh, if the command cannot be created, then an exception will be thrown, and it will ex explain all the, the the thing that got wrong. And if you see, if you're if you're familiar with Laravel, this get article request is the good thing that I really like about Laravel. I think it's the only thing that I like about Laravel is that you can actually use your own request and write your own validation rules. So behind the scene, I'm using the, the article. I'm using the validation rules that I put only in one place, only in my value object. So I will not have duplication of my validation rules. No HTTP request, no CLI method. No, no, I don't care. That's my only rule. That an, an UAD to be built must have a specific format. For example, if an article doesn't exist, what I will be returning, 404. So I'm translating from an exception in my domain to an HTTP layer. Same thing, impossible to, re art to retrieve article from a domain exception. I will translate it probably as a 500. And of course, I will be already logging all the issues that will be, uh, the information that will be helping me later to, uh, to debug the issue. And in the end, I'm using the mapper. A mapper is just a way to translate my set of value object that I'm retrieving or the aggregate that I'm retrieving in something that the HTTP method knows how to handle. For example, this can be just a JSON string, can be an array, right? But it can also be an XML or whatever. But it's, the changes are isolated only in one, in one object. On the other hand, we may have a CLI, right? We have commands. Same thing. I'm getting the argument. I'm creating the, the, the command here and see that Laravel doesn't give me a CLI validator has the, for the request. Uh, I need to do it just writing it. So I will just creating the command. If the ID is invalid, I will just print a nice error message saying, oops, the ID you entered is not valid. I should just follow the specific format. If it's good, I will just trigger the handler, so I will try to uh, retrieve the article. Same thing, if the article does not exist, I will print an error message, say, oops, sorry, I wasn't able to find it. If there's an error, I will just explain, oops, something was wrong for this, this, and this reason. At the very end, I will have also here a mapper, and I will translate in the article from an array, as it used to be before, to a string, so that it can be as actually printed out. So if we think now that we were like this, now we move to something like that. Everything is covered. And that's a little bit how we handled everything. So we have requests and inputs from one side that are used on a specific layer to create domain objects. So we are creating commands that are used to trigger use case, that are used to uh, query the repository, that behind the scene have a database implementation. Can also be an in-memory database, SQL, no SQL, it doesn't matter then will give us the aggregate back, and we'll be just giving the aggregate back to CLI and HTTP, and then we'll be translating the, uh, the aggregate as a, for example, HTTP uh, response or a CLI output. Instead, when I'm writing, same thing, request, HTTP layer, create a command, trigger the use case, go to the repository and write it. It's a good practice to do not return in right operation, but it's totally up to you if you want to do it and how you want to achieve it. This is just a, practi a practice that I do really often. 
Now, what if the framework change? So what if I'm moving from Yi framework one, that is 10 years old, to Symfony 4? I will be only dealing with this. So I will just need to map what is a request, uh, an HTTP concept, and a, and a command concept. And ORM. If I will just probably to change the ORM, or just maybe use a PDO connection that I do prefer, so I will have just less dependencies. And I'm done. I'm ready. So doing just a small recap, applying DDD gives us superpower. Super power. Some of them has not been covered, but if you're applying DDD good, you will be having some CQRS power to be done super easily in the future. Some event sourcing, that was a workshop today, that's using domain events, you can just easily achieve event sourcing here. And if you think about contexts and how they should be built, you already have in mind how probably your microservice should be looking like, how they should be built. Of course, this is not a one-to-one, -one, there's no one-to-one -one mapping between context and microservices, but just gives you an idea on how you should be building them. Then, you will updating your framework and libraries way more easily. New joiner will know the domain way before, so really good engineers will get better before the uh, just using just the tech stack. And just less break and changes across the whole system, because I will be able to swap super, small, super simple and small parts. And yeah, that's just a dream, but no more monolithic legacy code base. It's impossible. Just let me dream about it. And that's it.